You have questions? The Bible has answers. This program, overseen by the Philip Street Church of Christ, is dedicated to answering your questions with God's Word. Please join us for the period of study as we seek to give a Bible answer. And now, here is your moderator. Hello everyone and welcome to A Bible Answer. I'm Mike McDaniel, the evangelist of the Central Church of Christ in Carothersville, Missouri. We're so happy that you're watching A Bible Answer today. We have three gospel preachers with us to answer your questions. We'll have them introduce themselves to you at this time. Hello everyone, I'm David Looney, a minister for the Church of Christ. Hello, my name is Serge Shoemaker. I work with the Glendale Church of Christ in New Bern, Tennessee. My name is Justin Pasco, and I'm the preacher for the Ripley Church of Christ in Ripley, Tennessee. We're grateful to each of these brethren for taking time out of their busy schedules to be with us today to answer your questions. And we're appreciative to all those who have sent in these good questions. Before we begin, I want to say how much we appreciate the congregation at the Southwest End Boulevard Church of Christ in Cape Girardeau, Missouri. They're a new financial supporter of A Bible Answer. And we appreciate them very much. Now to our questions today to Brother David Looney. Where in the Bible does it connect Jesus with the word Christmas? Brother Looney. Mike, that's a great question and I have, I'm grateful to have the opportunity to answer that question. The Bible does not give the date of Jesus' birth, nor does it say that we should celebrate his birthday. As McClintock and Strong Cyclopedia states, and I quote, The observance of Christmas is not a divine appointment, nor is it of New Testament origin. End of quote. Instead of an examination of the history of Christmas, it exposes its roots in a religion and religious rites. The Bible shows that we offend God when we try to worship Him in a way that is not approved in the Scripture. I think about Exodus chapter 32 where the golden calf uh, was put into play and as uh, they were worshiping the golden calf, remember the tables of stone were thrown down, the calf was ground up, put into the water supply and they were made to drink it because God was not pleased with that innovation. Were you aware that Christians in the New Testament did not celebrate the birth of Jesus as an annual observance? Most Protestant churches did not begin celebrating Christmas until the 19th century. Isaiah prophesied of his birth, prophesied of his name, Emmanuel, and signified that God would live among them, Isaiah 7:14. In Matthew chapter 1, the uh, answer to that prophecy uh, is recorded there because in Matthew chapter 1 starting around verse 18 and following talks about the birth of Jesus Christ. So it's extremely important that he was born but it should be noted that uh, it's, it's more important about his name and about uh, all of the other things with regard to him. Micah also prophesies uh, about him. He, pro he promised that he would come. He sent a proclamation that he would come. The significance of Jesus' birth is that he made it possible, his birth made it possible for the establishment of the church, the kingdom of God, redemption and salvation from sin for both the Jew and the Gentile. Let me be clear here. For Jesus to come, to be born, was extremely important. But what I really want to get across, and I don't want to sound like I'm saying two different things, it was far more important when he died. His death, more is recorded in the scripture on his death than it ever is on his birth. And it was his blood that was shed that established the church. It was his blood that bought us salvation. It was his blood that is of the utmost importance. But also it's extremely important that you and I, through faithfulness and obedience, adhere to his word by faith, repentance, confession, baptism, and living faithfully. So if we want to access the blood of Christ that he shed upon his death, then we have to come in contact with that blood by uh, being baptized for the remission of sins. So his birth, yes, is important. But the way he lived, and more importantly, the way he died, has so much more to say. And here again, like I started out, the Bible does not tell us when he was born. So I hope this helps to answer the question. And again, thank you so much for that question. Thank you, and now to Brother Shoemaker. 
The person says, the Bible says if we live righteously, we shall suffer persecution. If we are not being persecuted, does that mean we are not living righteously? Brother Shoemaker. 2 Timothy 3 and verse 12 says that, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Now this is a rather alarming promise. Uh, and certainly we would all prefer to live lives free of persecution. But we also want to live lives that are righteous. We want to be certain of that. So uh, is there any way that we can have the one without the other? Can we have righteousness without persecution? Well, some would suggest here that Paul is speaking hyperbolically. You know, that is overstating a point to emphasize how generally true it is. Uh, for example, if I were to say everybody knows that 2 plus 2 equals 4, I would not mean literally everybody knows that, else nobody would have to be taught 2 plus 2 equals 4. But the truth is, it is such a, a readily recognized fact, so many people know it, that we might say, understandably, everybody knows 2 plus 2 equals 4. And you know, the Bible does use hyperbolic language. For example, in Colossians 1 and verse 23, Paul claims that the gospel had been preached in all creation under heaven. Now this passage seems to be a hyperbolic statement, uh, indicating that the gospel had been preached throughout the entirety uh, of the Roman Empire and not necessarily that it had been preached to every single human settlement across the globe. Now some have suggested that, that 2 Timothy 3 and verse 12 therefore might be another hyperbolic statement. That is, Paul's point is that persecution usually, but not always, always follows after righteous living. Now that's a possible interpretation, uh, but I'm not certain it's the correct one. In fact, the, the Bible simply says too much, too many times, too many different passages. The Bible connects the ideas of persecution and righteous living for me to discount every single one of them as hyperbole. You may recall, for example, in the Beatitudes where Jesus said, Blessed are ye when, when, not if ye suffer, pure, uh, suffer reproach, but when men shall reproach you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. In Acts chapter 14, verse 22, when Paul and Barnabas visited the Christians in uh, Lystra and Iconium and Antioch, we are told that they were exhorting them to continue in the faith and that through many tribulations we must enter into the kingdom. It seems that if we are to live for Christ, then we will suffer some form of persecution. Jesus himself warned, A servant is not greater than his Lord. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you, John 15 and verse 20. And he also promised that those who become his disciples would receive persecutions as certainly as they would receive eternal life, according to Mark 10 and verse 30. But we must remember that persecution may take many different forms. While we most often think of, of persecution as hostile actions arising from the government, you know, maybe in the forms of, of fines or imprisonments, uh, in extreme cases, beatings or even death, that's only one form of persecution. Ridicule from our neighbors is another form of persecution. Being overlooked for a promotion at work because you strictly hold to your Christian ethics is a form of persecution. Being decried as one who is a bigot or intolerant because you uh, stand on your principles, because you uh, refuse to teach anything other than Christ as the single way of salvation, those are forms of persecution. Having your business shut down because you refuse to compromise on your ethics, that's a form of persecution. Just because we haven't been thrown into prison for our faith doesn't mean we haven't been persecuted. But if we've never suffered at all for our faith, if we've never ruffled any feathers by taking a moral stand, then it's quite likely our faith has become so watered down that it is fundamentally no different from the morality of the world. And that's a problem. Again, Jesus warned, Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you, for in the same manner did their fathers to the false prophets. Luke 6 and verse 26. If everyone is always happy with the stance you're taking, then you probably aren't really taking a stance. The sad truth is we live in a fallen world that is opposed to righteousness. 
And so long as we are seeking to live righteously, we will have enemies in the world, and thus we will suffer persecutions. As Christians, we must be prepared to face it in any of its forms. Because our desire, first and foremost, is to please God. And that must be greater than our desire to avoid hardships. Thank you for asking this good question. Thank you. We reached the halfway point of our program today, and we want to offer you a free tract. Our track today is entitled, Sprinkling, Pouring, or Immersion. If you'd like to have this tract or our free eight-lesson Bible correspondence course on the Church of the Bible or both, or to send us your question, just contact us. You may do so by writing us at Philip Street Church of Christ, 912 Philip Street, Dyersburg, Tennessee, 38024. You can reach us by our website, www.abibleanswertv.org or by email a Bible answer at earthlink.net or you may call our toll-free number with your request 1-800-436-0463 and we look forward to hearing from you. Now back to our questions today to Brother Pascal for his first question. The person says, I know from the Word of God that the blood takes away sin, brings peace between God and man, Jew and Gentile. However, how does the blood of Jesus Christ do all of these things? Please share with me your understanding on this topic. This question, by the way, comes to us from someone from India. And we're happy to have, of course, watchers of a Bible answer around the globe. We'll give this to you, Brother Pascal. This is a great question. Uh, it's a very complex question. Uh, also, it's a question that has eternal ramifications. Uh, there's no way in the time that we have we could spend an entire program looking at just this one question. And so I want to encourage you, uh, after the answer, spend some time studying this question on your own as well. As we look at this, there are actually three questions that are asked by this individual. First, the question, how does the blood of Jesus take away sins? Uh, to answer that question, I want us to look at three different passages of Scripture. The first is found in the book of 1 Corinthians in chapter 15. In this chapter, Paul is discussing the gospel. He's discussing the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. And it's in this discussion that he begins to draw a comparison and a contrast between Adam and Jesus. In 1 Corinthians 15, verses 21 and 22, Paul writes, For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all will be made alive. Adam disobeyed God in the garden, and through that disobedience, sin and death entered the world. It was a perfect man who sinned in the garden, and therefore the sacrifice would need to be a perfect man. No other sacrifice would do. Jesus was the only one who could fit that bill. He was the only one who could live that perfect sinless life and be that sacrifice. In Hebrews chapter 10 verses 3 and 4, the Hebrew writer tells us that in those sacrifices, speaking of the sacrifices of the Old Testament, there is a remembrance again made of sin every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sin. Peter will tell us in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold from your vain conversations, received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Christ was that perfect sacrifice, and as such His blood can cleanse our sins. The second question that is asked in this is, how does the blood of Jesus bring peace between God and man? We need to understand that sin separates us from God. In Isaiah chapter 59, verses 1 and 10, Isaiah writes, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Now I realize Isaiah is writing to an apostate nation, but the principle that is brought forth here is true for the individual as well. If we are living in willful sin, then, 
that separates us from God. It puts a barrier and it causes a conflict between us and God. We've already noted that Jesus' blood cleanses sin and thus it has the ability to remove that barrier. In Colossians 1, 19 and 20, Paul writes, For it pleased the Father that in Him, Jesus, should all fullness dwell, and having made peace through the blood of His cross, by Him to reconcile all things unto Himself. By Him, I say, whether they be things on earth or things in heaven. And so Jesus' blood has the ability to reconcile us to God, to create peace between God and man. Third, the question is asked, how does the blood of Jesus bring peace between Jew and Gentile? For this, we want to go to the book of Ephesians. In Ephesians chapter 2, specifically verses 11 through 17, uh, deal with this Jew-Gentile problem. And I want us to focus in and not read the whole passage, but focus in on verses 15 and 16. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God by one body, by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. That one body is the church. And Colossians 1, 22 and 23, Ephesians 5, 23, uh, show us that the word body is used and is synonymous with the church. That church, that body was purchased with the blood of Christ. Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. Thus the blood of Jesus brought both Jew and Gentile together in the church, where they became Christians and Christians only. As I said at the beginning uh, of this question, it, it is a complex question, and it's a question that I would encourage you to study some more. Uh, but I hope what we've looked at has helped uh, to answer it to a degree, and I appreciate you answering, uh, asking this question. Thank you for that good answer. Now to Brother Looney. Does God punish people in this life with sickness? Brother Looney. I'm going to talk about Job for just a minute because he suffered so many things in his life. And regrettably, Job's friends did not understand or endure the mystery of his suffering. So they jumped to conclusions about the source. Let it be first said that Eliphaz, his friend, acknowledges that Job was a great source of comfort and strength uh, to others, Job chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. But then almost he pivots immediately and he puts the blame for Job's suffering squarely on Job himself. Think now, he says, who was, uh, who that was innocent ever perished? Or where were the upright cut off? As I have seen those who plow iniquity and sow trouble reap the same, Job 4, 7 and 8. Job's second friend, jumps on the bandwagon. Bildad says much the same thing. In Job chapter 8, verse 20, he says, See, God will not reject the blameless person, nor take the hand of evildoers. But then the third friend, Zophar, repeats the refrain, If iniquity is in your hand, put it far away from you, and do not let wickedness reside in your tents. Well, it is true, of course, that when we deliberately abuse our bodies with such things as alcohol, drugs, or sexual promiscuity, we pay a heavy price, both physically, mentally, and emotionally. God gave us our bodies. They are our temples to bring glory to Him. And when we ignore His laws and we treat our bodies with contempt, the inevitable is certainly going to happen. We're going to have injury. We're going to have sickness. It could result in the shortness of a person's life. The Bible commands us to take care of our bodies, and when we fail to do this, there are problems. If God punished people with sickness in this life, would that not make him a respecter of persons? Who would he choose or who would he not choose? Romans 2.11 says, For there is no respect of persons with God. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 25, pretty much the same, He that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done. There is no respect of persons. In Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 and 8, listen to what it says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. 
but he that soweth of the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap everlasting life. I think about the prodigal son. Remember when he went to his dad, he said, Dad, give me mine inheritance. What was he saying to his dad's face? Dad, I don't care if you're living or dead because the inheritance comes after someone dies. I just want my money. And he took it and it says that he left and spent his life on riotous living with harlots. The money was gone. The friendships were gone or the so-called friendships, should I say, were gone. He started feeding hogs. Think about a Jewish boy feeding an unclean animal. And then when he poured the the uh, mixture out of that pail into the trough, he's saying, scoot over, I'm going to eat with you because I am starving. But then there's something remarkable about this story. He says, I came to myself. And when he came to himself, he said, I've got to return to my father. Folks, I want you to understand the father in this story is God, and he is waiting with open arms. Now, in that story, his dad saw him coming over the horizon, and he could have easily said, you crawl back to me because you left me in the way that you did. But the Bible says that he ran, and he fell upon his son's neck, and he kissed him. Stench and all was probably the greatest smell he had smelled in some time because his son that he thought was dead was now back home with him again. Kill the fatty calf, bring out a robe, put sandals on his feet, and we're going to make merry that he has returned. Now, it's inevitable that somebody is probably going to tie in John chapter 10, verse 28 here, so I want to address that. And I give unto them eternal life. And they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck you out of the hand of God. You know, there are those who say, you know, I've got eternal life, and once I got it, I got it. So sick or not, I'm just going to get to go to my reward sooner. Well, that's not always the case. No man can pluck you out of the hand of God, but you can certainly take yourself out, just like the prodigal son did, by making foolish choices, turning from God, turning from family, living a life with harlots, living a life of sin. And any time you do that, you're going to suffer the consequences. You will lose your soul salvation and you will be in a state where you do not want to be. But again, to reiterate, God does not punish people with sickness. That sickness comes because of poor choices oftentimes that we make. What a great question. Thank you for the opportunity to answer. Thank you. Now to Brother Shoemaker, what is meant by the words higher criticism? Brother Shoemaker. Well, this is a very involved question, and so we're going to do our best to give a concise answer to it. In this context, criticism refers to uh, examining questions regarding the biblical text. Lower criticism is an attempt to determine the original reading of the text. Higher criticism addresses the historical background of the various biblical books. It attempts to answer questions like, who wrote this? Uh, to whom was it written? When were they writing? What was the purpose of their writing? Now that is the general meaning of higher criticism. And in that general sense, we have to admit, I think, that asking those questions and answering those questions, that, that's a good thing. Our understanding of the biblical text and our ability to properly understand it, properly interpret it, properly apply it, is greatly furthered by digging into the backgrounds of the 66 biblical books. However, the term higher criticism is commonly used in a more technical sense, which the sincere Bible student should be wary of. Uh, beginning in the mid-19th century, religious scholars tried uh, applying the, the principles of the Enlightenment to the, the study of the Bible. Uh, and there was a fundamental problem to their approach. That is, the Bible was no longer treated uh, as inspired but was instead assumed to be a purely human document. That is, it was produced by human minds, it was driven by human motives, and it contained human errors. One of the faulty uh, techniques commonly practiced as part of higher criticism included the assumption that uh, different vocabularies within a work must indicate that there were different authors. Uh, a common example of that is the, the Torah, the first five books of the Bible from Genesis to Deuteronomy, were claimed to be not one single work written by Moses, but instead four different works by four different authors uh, that was later assembled by uh, an editor, uh, maybe Ezra is commonly suggested, and the reason they think this is because they say, look at the different vocabulary in these different sections. There had to have been different authors. Another mistake uh, is the assumption that common material proves dependence, like 
Uh, because Matthew and Mark are so similar in the stories that they relate from the life of Christ, one, usually Matthew, is it said it, he must have borrowed his material from Mark. We don't have two independent sources here. We have a, a telling and then a retelling. Uh, higher critics have often made assumptions about what a person of a given culture and given time might have said and then disregarded anything that didn't fit those assumptions. Uh, the famous Jesus seminar of the late 20th century ended up dismissing 82% of Jesus' statements from the gospel because he said that doesn't even resemble something that Jesus would have said, and so we know he didn't say it. Now, obviously, a detailed response to uh, every claim and every mistake made in the name of higher criticism is well beyond what we can do here. But let me simply point out, not uh, a single one of these claims is based in manuscript evidence or is based in ancient tradition. Now, if you really want to dig into this uh, further, I want to suggest you visit maybe uh, Apologetics Press and their website, which has a number of great articles which can give you much more detailed information. It's not wrong to ask the questions asked by higher criticism, but we want to make sure we approach these questions in a way that avoids the assumptions that they make and treats the Bible with its proper respect. Thank you for taking the time to ask us this challenging question. We want to extend our thanks to Brother Looney and Brother Shoemaker, Brother Pascal doing such a good job today in answering these Bible questions. Uh, we've recently heard from people who have just found a Bible answer. They've been flipping their remote, and now they're starting to watch a Bible answer on a weekly basis. Uh, we're glad for them, and we encourage you that if you found a Bible answer, please share this with your friends and family and relatives. Uh, sometimes word of mouth is the best advertisement that we have. One congregation recently called me and they wanted uh, our logo because they wanted to purchase an ad in their local newspaper and advertise a Bible answer in their community. And we were happy to supply them with that and we thought, my, that's a good idea and we're appreciative to them uh, for doing that. So please tell other people about this program and where it may be seen in your area. Uh, I get calls sometimes wanting to know uh, because it may not be on. Uh, you know, their relationship now with cable and direct TV and DISH and certain networks over which we have no control. Thanks so much for watching A Bible Answer today. And remember, for your Bible questions, there's always a Bible answer. We would love to hear from you, our viewers. If you have questions for A Bible Answer, or if you'd like any of the material offered on this program, please contact us at the address on the screen. We appreciate all of our supporters, and we encourage you to worship with the faithful Church of Christ in your area.